W.E.B. Du Bois once pointed out famously that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. And looking back on it, you know what? Du Bois was right. It was one hell of a century. And for most black people, that hell started in the South. For one family, it began in a place called Patton Junction, Alabama. It was there that a group of black coal miners went out on strike. The hours were too long, the wages were too low. They had no right that a white Alabaman was bound to respect. So they went out on strike. And the company wasn't having it. No. They called together the sheriff and a group of vigilantes. And they marched down to the union hall that sat in the middle of a cornfield. And the sheriff called out, hey, you boys, come on out of there. And the answer was silence. I said, come on out, again. So the sheriff said, OK. And he picked up his rifle and put it to his shoulder. But then his son stopped him and said, Daddy, let every man stand for himself. And the boy dropped down on one knee, put his rifle to his shoulder, and boom, pulled the trigger. And don't you know that was the last trigger that that boy ever pulled? Because the miners were hiding in the cornfield. And when he pulled that trigger, they pulled their triggers too. And that was the end of Patton Junction and the end of that strike. Now, as the story goes, they sent in troops to go after the miners. But the poor whites in the adjoining county cut the railroad tracks so the troops couldn't come in. And the miners and their families were able to escape. Some went to Oklahoma, but a tornado blew down the house. So they moved to a place called Wolf Pit, Kentucky, but the Klan drove them out. So they joined the hundreds of thousands of other African Americans in the great migration north looking for jobs in Otto and Steele and places like uh, uh, Cleveland and uh, Detroit and Gary. And, and these were the circumstances that shaped that period, including the founding of the Communist Party. Now, as things turned out, one of the daughters of one of the miners at Patton Junction ended up as the only woman on the picket line during the little steel strike of 1937. Well, it made sense. Her daddy was a union man, and she never met a strike that she didn't like. Her name was Pauline Taylor, and it was there that she met Gus Hall, who was one of 50 communist organizers hired by John L. Lewis to help found the Steelworkers Union. She went on to lead the local NAACP, ran for governor of Ohio in 1948 on the Progressive Party line, and joined in the effort to ban atomic weapons along with folks like Madame Curie and uh, Pablo Picasso and uh, Islanda and Paul Robeson, the latter two with whom she became a little friendly. And maybe it was because of that friendship that she got the idea one day to invite Paul to come to town to give a concert. Excited, on the first day, she called her church. Why, sure, Sister Taylor, we would be more than happy to have Paul sing at Shiloh. On the second day, she got it in the local newspaper. The headline read, Paul Robeson to sing at Shiloh. On the third day, she got death threats. There'll be bombs and bullets at Shiloh. On the fourth day, Shiloh canceled. Not to be outdone, she went to see the local sheriff, excuse me, chief of police, and she said, Chief Allen, we have invited Paul to Youngstown. We have gotten death threats. We need police protection. Allen said, Paul who? Listen, Mr. Man, 
Either you do your job or we'll do ours. Paul is coming to town. And sure enough, on the evening that Paul arrived at the local Greyhound station from Cleveland, he was met by a little caravan organized by the Steel City Sportsman's Club, a group of bear and deer hunting brothers who felt obliged to do what the local police department wouldn't. And weren't they all surprised when they walked out of the Greyhound station and found it surrounded by Chief Allen's police. And maybe these were the reasons why Mrs. Taylor was hauled two times before the House Un-American Activities Committee and was one of 100 African American leaders from around the country, along with Coleman Young of Detroit and Harold Washington of Chicago, defended at a Madison Square Garden rally against McCarthyism. Now, listen to me. Mrs. Taylor was not a member of the party. I know that because she was my grandma. <laughs> she was a left wing, deeply religious Christian woman who admired the party's championing of the fight for racial justice and the class struggle. And if there's one thing that you can say about this party, is that we champion the fight for racial justice and the class struggle. Sometimes we did it better. Other times we did it not as good, but we always did it. Whether or not it was in the fight of the steel workers rank and file for affirmative action, or in the fight to free Angela Davis, or in the fight for sanctions against the racist regime in South Africa, or in today's fight for black and brown lives, this party has always maintained that the fight against racism and sexism and homophobia, and I gotta say because of all that craziness going on in Washington, Islamophobia and the attacks on that system, we have always said that the fight against these things are principal questions for us from which we must never, ever retreat. And so, as we confront this administration in Washington that is using racism as a central organizing principle, let us um, draw uh, inspiration from these old stories about our sheroes and heroes. And as we build a united front against their policies, as was done so fabulously last November by the broad movement against Trump. Let us remember that, that, that these victories and these struggles are built on the shoulders of giants. Thank you very much.